Okay, we're live. Cool, and everyone can hear? Yes, but your video is lagging. All right, um, so why don't we just go around in a, in a circle and, um, <laughs> yes, it is? Okay. Um, I mean, there's always going to be a little bit of a lag because I'm also, like, I'm recording, like, it's recording on Hangouts on Air and I'm also recording on ScreenFlow. Um, so if I have to turn my video off, then I'll, I'll do so. Um, okay. Okay, so why don't we start with just kind of go in a row. Um, like, on my screen, it might look a little bit different on your screen. Um, Cherry, Christina, Kim, and Olivia. Why don't we go in that order and just say a bit about yourselves. Um, there's actually two um, classes here. We have social media, um, some people from the social media mashup class and some people from the collaboration and network environments class. Um, and just, you know, um, within this, this whole uh, guest speaker session, so it's nice to have, to have um, people from both. But just say a bit about what your background is and why you're taking the class. I think my mic is muted. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. All right. Um, this class just sounds really interesting to me because I love making YouTube videos and I was always worried about copyrights and mm. like that's exactly what this conference was supposed to be about. So um, I just wanted to hear more about like not just the technical aspect of it, you know, actually making a mashup, but like how you run into conventional, you know, um, legal issues and how you deal with that and how that impacts your ability to be creative. Okay. Thank you for coming. <laughs> sure, it's a pleasure. Thank you. All right, Christina? Everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, I'm Christina. Uh, this is my last semester at the new school. Um, I'm taking this class for a variety of reasons, but I think um, the most dominant is that the class is, isn't structured, uh, and I like the challenge of working through problems um, that are pretty typical for us because we work in digital media all of the time, mm -hmm. but collaborating with individuals um, that I'm not sitting right next to uh, has been a growing it's been a really nice experience. I'm growing and learning from it a lot. Um, I guess that's probably my thing. Cool. Great. And Kim? Okay, my turn. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Oh, okay. Uh, good evening and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. I'm Kim Springer uh, with the Network Collaboration. These are my good. Um, <laughs> Hi. I have my daughter, so, you know, she's 11 months, and so I'm not on the camera. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, but um, this is my fourth semester um, in the Media Studies program, and my, um, my research interest is mainly um, media literacy and uh, media research. So I'm really drawn to the online um, world, and I took this class out of curiosity just to see how um, I can get more into networks and collaborating. I, I think eventually I'll probably um, do some kind of online teaching, online mediated environments, things like that. So I'm looking at this class just really to figure out the path I want to take mm -hmm. with uh, media literacy and just uh, being online. So still trying to figure all that out, but this is it's been really helpful. It's just a really vast, big field. So just trying to really pinpoint which direction I'm going to go in. Cool. Great. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so I'm in the social media mashup class, and I have designed my own major at the new school of social and environmental media. And uh, basically, I'm working in like the filmmaking realm and uh, have had some trouble with music and music licensing, so this video is awesome for me. Mm. Um, but I'm also, yeah, so I'm, I was, took this class out of curiosity. I've never taken an online class before. Um, and I communicate with people who have never met over email, online, so it's kind of interesting to work collaboratively with someone on a class project. Um, and on assignments, so that's why I kind of took this class, and I thought it sounded interesting. So, yeah. 
Very cool. Well, it's, it's really great, great to meet you all. Yeah, thanks, everybody. So, Aram, why don't you go ahead and say a bit about yourself, and we can launch into the discussion. Sure. Um, like many of you guys, I am completely fascinated by online media and um, the way that it not only changes uh, our patterns of interaction with each other, but, but it changes the, the realm of uh, cultural possibilities. Um, you know, if you think about what we spend our days in front of our screens doing, whether it's, you know, the little screen or the medium-sized screen or the, the giant screen in, in our living room, um, most of what we do, we couldn't even really have imagined 15 or, or 20 years ago. You know, the concept of a mashup, the concept of a remix, um, the concept of, you know, machinima or video game mods or memes or any of the kind of amazing stuff that we take for granted now, it's also brand new. And, you know, because culture is kind of the operating system for human society, it really means that, that everything else about how uh, we organize our lives together has to be rethought from the ground up fundamentally. You know, the old laws don't work right, the old economies don't work right, um, you know, the old universities and churches don't, and governments don't work right, right? I mean, look at, look at what WikiLeaks uh, alone has done to... Uh, you know, to both the, the you know, the, the, the realm of news gathering and the realm of, of political action and influence. So I kind of fell ass backwards into this field. You know, when I started researching digital, there basically was no digital yet. I, I was an HTML jockey way back in the mid-1990s. And the reason I got into coding, are you interested in this? Should I go into my biography now? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> I think that's a resounding yes. <laughs> yep. The reason I got into HTML was, first of all, there was a really cute girl in college with me. Uh, I graduated in '94. There was a really cute girl who said that I, you know, we were having the "What do you want to be when you grow up?" conversation, and she said, um, she said she wanted to uh, work in multimedia. And I was like, "What's that?" You know. Uh, I had no. I just simply had no idea. I mean, I, I was a big fan of science fiction. You know, I was. I loved you know kind of Douglas Adams and the notion of like a galactic information network and was something that was immediately familiar to me. But it wasn't immediately clear. And and I had used the internet since about ninety two to like email and to you know do text based search and stuff like that. But it was really just kind of geeking out and thinking like, wow, this is so sci fi. Um, but two of my closest friends were having a conversation in about 1995 about HTML, and I couldn't c contribute to the conversation. I started to get very jealous, so I decided I'd go out there and learn HTML, and took a class actually at the new school. It was a summer class, um, and uh, I uh, I took the class and immediately got a job as like a you know web developer for a big law firm in New York. And then um, applied for and got a job at a company that I knew nothing about. This is now 17 years ago. Uh, at, it was called Jupiter Communications at the time. And unbeknownst to me, Jupiter was the... First, not only did I not really know anything about the Internet, I had just learned to program HTML, I also knew nothing about research as a field of, of, uh, of, of labor. Right? I was an English major and a musician in college, um, while I was kind of science friendly, you know, I went to Stuyvesant, which was a science and math public high school in New York. I didn't, you know, I had no background whatsoever in, in, in technology uh, or in kind of formal research. So I kind of got this job that was like an entry level position at this company that, fortunately for me, was the one that was um, kind of at the forefront of figuring out what this new internet thing was all about and what it was going to do for. Uh, the existing industries and companies that were out there. So I kind of, it was, it was like being in graduate school almost, kind of like getting an MBA and a PhD at the same time. And, you know, very, very rapidly I had to learn this new language, not only the technological language, you know, of, you know, bits and bytes and, uh, you know, ISPs and, uh, you know, uh, all the various kind of uh, jargon that, that we, that roll so trippingly off our tongue now, but I also had to learn, you know, how to produce research, how to think about a problem in a way that can be solved quantitatively, how to execute on, on, that, uh, on that problem, and then how to write it up in a way that clients were going to understand. 
you know, which are really very separate skills. And, and some people are very good at one part of that, but not so good at the other part. Um, so by the time I was in my mid to late twenties, I had, you know, kind of lucked into this opportunity to be like the guy who knew about, you know, how digital technology was changing the entertainment and media industries, uh, specifically the music industry. I did a lot of work in that field. And, um, you know, got to kind of make a name for myself doing that. But then I kind of burnt out on that um, because I realized that I was kind of telling the same story over and over again. You know, none of my clients wanted to hear kind of my big ideas. They just wanted to, me to tell them, you know, well, what's the value of this market going to be five years down the line? It's all about creating five-year projections and kind of helping these companies that were too stupid to help themselves, you know, which feels kind of philanthropic at first, but then you realize they're making billions of dollars and they're idiots and you're like getting paid a five-figure salary and, uh, you know, you're the one who supposedly has all the answers. So I was reading an article one day. I was there for like five or six years and I was reading an article, you know, through the whole kind of dot-com boom and, and bust and uh, there was some research that had come out of like MIT Media Lab at the time. Some really just kind of cool stuff about, you know, the kind of thing I was actually interested in about how the internet was changing people's lives. And I thought to myself, wow, it'd be really cool to do that kind of research instead of the kind of research that I do. And then one of those cartoon light bulbs went off above my head and I was like, hey stupid, you can, <laughs> right? There's, there's nothing stopping you. So I applied to, uh, to go to grad school and get a, uh, ended up getting a PhD in communication at uh, USC Annenberg out in LA and really had the opportunity to kind of take that perspective that I'd gotten analyzing the internet for the purposes of business and apply it to questions that I thought were particularly fascinating. One of the very first things that I started researching when I got there was mashups, which were pretty much a brand new phenomenon. This is like 11 years ago. And, uh, you know, I started interviewing mashup DJs in, uh, in the UK mostly, but also in the US, and trying to get a sense of, you know, it seemed to me, as a musician and as a uh, techno-futurist, that there was something fundamentally different about mashups as a form that, you know, regardless of what the particular subject matter was, whether it was matching up Nirvana and, uh, you know, um, Destiny's Child or whether it was mashing up The Strokes and, and Christina Aguilera, those were kind of the big mashups at the time. Um, you know, and, and then a little bit later, The, the Beatles and Jay-Z, that regardless of the content, there was something intrinsic in the act of mashing up that was very different than anything that had happened before, aesthetically or technologically. And um, that kind of set me down this path of really exploring, you know, what I think of as the kind of uh, the resistant political implications of rewiring culture, right? You know. It's, it's not simply accidental that, that, that these new cultural ideas force us to reevaluate our economies, our laws, our religions, our institutions, and so forth. Um, there is something tacitly and explicitly um, revolutionary about these kinds of behaviors, right? Because in a, in a culture that is where information is the primary asset, right? And I'm certainly not the first one to point this out. Everyone talks about Western post-industrial society as an information society, right? You can't fly a plane or drive a car without information. You can't make espresso without information, right? There's a chip in everything these days, and every chip is networked to every other chip, right? And every network carries not only data flows, but economic flows, right? And those economic flows um, are the conduits for power flows, right? And, and you get these kinds of systems on systems on systems on systems, all based on these little nodes of interactivity. Um, so, there is something that is profoundly threatening to these established institutions once you start rewiring the cultural logic that drives a society. And that ended up being what I did my dissertation on. Um, I wrote a dissertation basically where I interviewed dozens and dozens of mashup artists uh, and other DJs too, hip-hop DJs, techno DJs, um, as well as music industry executives and uh, and attorneys working in, in copyright, because obviously copyright is a big part of this uh, picture and getting bigger all the time, right? It's kind of the last bastion against chaos from the point of view of the, the media cartels, right? It used to be they could, like, just, you know, they own the truck that took the product to the store uh, where consumers would buy it, but now the trucks have gone away. All they own is the permission 
the permission to keep other people from distributing the stuff that they distribute. Um, so I wrote that dissertation, which I later turned into the book Mashed Up, which was my first book uh, published back in 2010. Uh, maybe you guys read a chapter of it for class. I, I'm not sure what Josephine uh, has uh, uh, The link is on the syllabus to that chapter, and I also posted, posted it um, in our Google Plus community. But I'll post it in here now, too. OK, so some subset of the class. I know with one of my students, I just asked them out outright. I'm like, who did the reading? And I'll get kind of a couple of people shyly raising their hands. And then some people just brazenly staring at me with like deer eyes. Like, read, there's a reading? Um, but you guys are master students, right? The um, Collaboration and Networked Environments class is a grad class. And the Social Media Mashup class is an undergrad class. OK, cool. So it's a mashup. It is totally a mashup. It's totally made a mashup. <laughs> Very cool. Well, there are benefits to both. I mean, I love teaching undergrads, and I love teaching grads. Um, so that's kind of how I got here, you know, uh, in a nutshell. I, I worked at NYU for a few years as a visiting professor. Then I went back. I, I got kind of had a little falling out over there, and I went back to the world of private industry because I was like, screw you guys. I'm going to go make a lot of money. And then I kind of took all that knowledge that I developed in grad school, and I applied it, I was the uh, director of marketing innovation at uh, OMD, which is the world's largest media agency. You know, my big clients were like Pepsi and Levi's and Visa, and I was trying to take these new. I, I was trying to take what I knew about memes and social media, and you know, emerging platforms, and you know, use them to make people buy sugar water that's going to give them diabetes, and it. It made me really profoundly depressed, even though my bank account was getting really full really fast. Um, but that didn't last very long, and I ended up coming back uh, to academia and have been at uh, Rutgers as a professor since uh, 2010, so for about three and a half years. Um, but I still kind of have one foot in each world. I'm still a working musician, so I have kind of a foot in the art world, and I still do a lot of consulting on the side. I write reports for GigaOM, if you know them, uh, and I kind of consult for companies like uh, just last week, I can't say which, but I had a consultation with a consumer electronics company that's thinking of launching uh, a new platform for um, for digital audio devices. Um, so I kind of, you know, try to, try to, I'm like a tripod. I kind of try to see things from all three perspectives so that I can write books and articles that are going to make sense to everybody, that can actually bring these very different stakeholders into the room together where they can actually talk about the same thing using the same language. And I'd like to say I've been fantastically successful at doing that, um, but that's probably would be overstating the case. But by the same token, you know, there, there, I, I, I've certainly played my little part. You know, I've, I've put a brick into this, um, you know, into this pyramid of universal utopian technological understanding that we're trying to build. Um, so, uh, so that's me in a nutshell. Um, I can launch into a presentation, if you like, based on Mashed Up, or we can kind of... Yeah, let me go ahead and um, share my screen, and then if you just want to talk through some of the things, and if we get any kind of questions or points along the way, um, we, can, we can do that. Okay. Yeah, anyone should feel free. This is not me standing on a podium. This is us in a hangout, hanging out. So, you know, feel free to, to push back and... Uh, Ask questions, and, you know. Mash what it is up. your What is your class? What do you teach? Uh, I teach a bunch of different things. At the undergrad level, my two main classes are I teach one called Musical Cultures and Industries, um, which is exactly what you think it is. It's like thirteen different ways of understanding the role that music plays in society. And I teach another class called uh, Copyright Communication and Culture, I think, and it's basically teaching students not only about the kind of ins and outs of the law, the like the copyright law, but helping them to understand how copyright acts as a kind of regulatory mechanism for culture, right? In essence, copyright says this person is allowed to share that information with that person using that medium, right? And that's a profoundly political thing. Um, so, and, you know, we talk about copyleft and, you know, free software and kind of all the, the different innovations that have come up in that field over the last... 30 years or so. Um, and then at the graduate level, uh, I have a doctoral course called Visions and Revisions of Cyberspace. That's really about kind of the, the you know, uh, 
the schizophrenic origins of the internet, right? It was built by the Defense Department. It was built by, by what's now called DARPA uh, back in 1969, basically as a way to decentralize communications in case we got nuked by the Russians. Um, but by the same token, you know, the early adopters of the technology were all university hippies. Um, and, you know, the, the people that first saw social application of the technology were, you know, were actual hippies. You know, it was like Stuart Brand and the kind of whole earth movement and, and early online, you know, BBSs and, and chat sites like The Well, um, you know, where people actually believed that they were transcending corporeality, you know, and, and, and um, mortality, really. And, and entering into some kind of magical space where anything will happen. Um, and those two strains, you know, are still very much duking it out. I mean, look at the, you know, all the recent battles over, you know, the Snowden revelations, the Manning revelations, and the TPP and ACTA and FIFA and SOPA. You know, it's exactly that tension that, uh, that was birthed at the Internet's genesis that's still playing out. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I think the hippies are losing at the moment. Yeah. Which is why I wrote my second book, um, which is about to come out in a few weeks, uh, called The Piracy Crusade. Very so, exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, um, just to let people know, I have shared my screen. If um, you want to see it in the bigger window, you can just click on my little thumbnail, and that will place it in the bigger window. And Aram, if you want to um, just kind of like, well, if, if I'm on the wrong screen, they just kind of like prompt me through whatever screen you want me to be on? Sure, I'll just say click or beep or something like click. that. Click, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me, so this is basically, I'm walking you through the book, kind of piece by piece, because the whole book is one long argument, basically. But I'll skip through certain parts and delve into other parts, and like I said, you guys should jump in whenever you want to ask a question or, or uh, clarify something. Go ahead. All right, so I, I, I begin by talking about something uh, very interesting that happened a few years ago, um, which is that there was a, a huge raid on the, the uh, Atlanta-based recording studio of this guy, um, DJ Drama, who some of you might know. He's, he was, at the time, one of America's biggest hip-hop producers and had a very popular mixtape series called Gangsta Grills. So one morning, un totally unexpectedly, a SWAT team 40, 40 SWAT officers with drug-sniffing dogs and assault rifles burst into his recording studios and took everything. They took his cars, his computers, and uh, basically everything that wasn't nailed down in some things that were. And they took him to jail, um, as well as his partner, Don Cannon, and they booked him on RICO charges, which is like the stuff that they get Tony Soprano on. And the crime was distributing unlicensed mixtapes. Now, the irony of the situation, and I actually talked to Drama for this book, and I interview him with it, is that he was getting, and do, does anyone not know what a mixtape is? I, I bet you do, but I can describe it if you want. Thank you. We do. Okay, cool. So, um, the irony of it is, of course, that Drama made his money by getting paid by the major labels to put their artists on his mixtapes, right? Like twenty-five dollars or $30,000 a pop. Right, there's a new, you know, song by Drake coming out, you know, oh, well, you've got to put that on the mixtape first. Why? Because the mixtape is like the best advertising medium for hip-hop that was ever invented, right? If you hear it in a barber shop or a strip club or any of the other kind of places that comprise the very large mix mixtape network in the U.S., um, you know, it's going to have the kind of ring of authenticity that makes you believe in the artist and, and you know, there would be no, you know, Fitty Sen or T.I. or you know, most of the big hip-hop acts that have broken over the last 10 years were big mixtape uh, stars before they had major label uh, deals, let alone platinum selling albums. Um, so here's a guy who's been, who's been paid hundreds of thousands of dollars by the major labels, and then he gets busted by the major labels. He's the RAAA, as you can see from this picture that organized the raid. And so I began to, that, the book with the story, to kind of think about how can it be that the music industry would have such a kind of bipolar reaction to this, uh, to this new kind of uh, distribution medium for the technology. So click forward. As it turns out, this idea is, uh, is, is not that, uh, it, it's not such a new problem that we have, even though the technology is new. 
And the way that I frame the argument is typically you see these kinds of conversations about free culture. Maybe you guys know Lawrence Lessig and Creative Commons and all that stuff. And the notion is, well, you know, here's kind of private culture, or well, here's public culture that everybody shares, and then the private interests kind of come and scoop it all up. These kinds of corporations come and try to own as much as possible. And while that's certainly true, click forward, what I'm interested in is the stuff that kind of falls between the cracks of public and private. The gray area, what I call configurable culture, where it's not so easy to tell who owns what and who created something and who consumed something, where you know the kind of rules get mixed up because because we don't really understand what's happening. Um, and it, my argument is that you know the process of trying to draw lines in that gray area is itself the process of us as a society trying to figure out what the new rules are. Uh, now that networks kind of def digital networks kind of define our lives, click forward. Should I just say click? Or yeah. Beep? Okay. Thank you. So as it turns out, um, this notion that powerful institutions need to control music has actually been around for thousands of years. Um, that guy on the left is uh, uh, is Plato, and um, you know he wrote in uh, in his best known work in uh, the Republic. Basically, he was advising the leaders of Athens, the state, you can click forward, that they uh, should uh, should not allow new and innovative music. Oh, that's weird that it didn't click forward. Whatever. I'll leave it there. So okay. basically, Plato's argument to the, the, the heads of Athens were that if you allow people to listen to new and innovative music, then they're going to have new and innovative feelings, which is going to lead to new and innovative laws, and you're going to be out of office. He actually said this. This is like 2,500 years ago. And the amazing thing, that other guy in the picture that we were just looking at um, was a Confucian scholar who, about 100 years later in China, made exactly the same argument. Right? So you have, throughout history, and you see this in every era, in every continent, you see powerful institutions, churches, governments, um, markets, other institutions, essentially trying to control how music is circulated. Because music acts as this kind of um, source code for human action, right? I mean, that's what music really is. It's not a form of entertainment, per se. It's, it's an elemental dimension of the human psyche. And what it does is it makes us think new ideas. It makes us move, and more importantly, organize collectively in new ways, right? Every piece of music is essentially a sonic map for how people can interrelate. And if you think about it, you know, for instance, an orchestra, has a very different kind of organizational system than like a jazz band, right? Or a couple of DJs on turntables. So um, I, I like this quote a lot from Yellow Submarine, if you guys have ever seen it. But the first thing the Blue Minions do when they come and take over Pepperland is they capture everything that make up music. They take the instruments and they lock them up. And part of what I'm arguing is that what the RAAA were doing with uh, DJ Drama was part of that same continuum, right? The music was fundamentally threatening to the established institutions, and therefore had to be shut down. Click. I'm going to skip this. Click. All right. This is kind of like the big schematic that's trying to describe everything. And it's a lot of big words and fancy arrows and stuff. But what I'm basically saying is that when an institution tries to control music. It does so in three ways, primarily. One is through legal means, you know, like copyright law. One is through ideological means, you know, like calling rock and roll the devil's music or what have you. And one is by commercial means, like, you know, Walmart saying that they won't carry the Dixie Chicks or something along those lines. And when they're acting on music, they, similarly, they, they act on three different things. One is the aesthetic. It's like Plato saying, well, you should be able to play this kind of music, but not that kind of music. Part of it is the praxis, which is a fancy word for what people actually do uh, with the ideas that you give them. So, for instance, telling street musicians they can't play in the subway without a permit, right? That would be the regulation of musical praxis. And then there's regulating the technology itself, right? For instance, when you know you download a movie from iTunes and you try to burn it onto a DVD and it says you can't do that, right? That's the regulation of the technology. So you have these three kinds of forms of regulation and these three sites of regulation. 
And at the same time, you get always get resistance. Wherever somebody tries to regulate somebody else, that somebody else is resisting and trying to find ways around that regulation. And part of what I argue in this book is that that is a circular process that produces innovation, right? Much in the same way that when you see a tree growing against a fence, the tree will kind of warp and mold itself to get around the fence. That's exactly what happens with culture, right? You look at like hip hop, right? The origins of hip hop, for instance, where you know you take a playback mechanism, right? They, they defunded music in the public schools, um, and then what did the kids do? They took the playback mechanism of the turntable and they turned it inst into an instrument, right? That's a kind of a classic example of how you know the uh, commercial regulation of musical technology was resisted very effectively. By uh, by the people that were being regulated. Uh, click forward, please. So all that happens inside of a larger context, which is um, you know what I call the uh, the discursive framework. And again, that's just a big fancy word to mean the set of ideas that we have, the discourse about what music is and what it means for society. So there might be push and there might be push back. But that push and push back is bounded by our set of ideas, by our, by our definitions. For instance, in the U.S., we have this set of definitions about music, that it's a kind of entertainment, or that it's a form of intellectual property, or that it's a form of labor, right? These are all ideas that we're very familiar with, and we kind of take them for granted, right? But if you look at, like, the Indian classical music tradition, which has been around for thousands of years and is still very much alive, um, they actually understand music as a kind of supernatural entity, that manifests itself through the musicians who are playing, which, if you think about it, is actually a perfectly legitimate way to understand music, right? Um, so that discursive framework really kind of uh, limits the degree to which that push and pull process that I was before can uh, can move, right? There's only so far that you can innovate if you're stuck inside of a particular framework. Click, and of course that framework is never an accident. Um, that framework is always kind of a map of the social institutions that rule a society. So in a, um, you know, in an industrial capitalist society like America, of course we're going to frame, uh, frame music as a kind of property, right? Because music is the most natural element of the human psyche, or one of the most natural elements. And therefore, if it can be commoditized, that means that commodities are natural, right? Um, in, you know, in a more kind of caste system, like uh, like traditional Indian society, you know, you have this special class of people who are uniquely uh, trained uh, to to bring these supernatural to, to channel these supernatural entities. That kind of reinforces the validity of a of a theocratic system that has the priests at the top, right? So the music is always used to kind of validate whatever systems of of uh, social control exist, and the discursive framework is the way that that remains constant. There might be push and pull and push and pull for a, a hundred years or a thousand years, but as long as that framework stays constant, those institutions that are matched by the framework don't have to worry. Click. Are you all with me or am I speaking in psycho babble? Yes? Good. Okay, I saw some thumbs up. So let me tell you about the time that the last time that the discursive framework changed in Western culture. This guy lived about uh, 200 years ago. His name was uh, Hector Berlioz. He was uh, kind of a big shot, uh, well, became kind of a big shot in the kind of French classical music culture. And, but when he started out, he was kind of a, a real rebel. Um, he clicked, absolutely was in love with Beethoven. Beethoven was like in his father's generation. And he thought Beethoven was like the greatest genius in the history of the world. And just wanted to emulate him. He copied Beethoven's hairstyle and his dressing style and, you know, kind of lived and breathed for Beethoven. Even though Beethoven was, was German, he was from Bonn, and obviously Berlioz was French. Now this thing happened where there was this older composer who was more established. He was kind of like the, he was the big deal at the time in Paris, named, uh, named uh, Franz Joseph Fetis. And what Fetis did was he uh, there was a local publisher. Remember, you know, in those days, if you want to hear music from another country, you can't, like, there's no, like, planes or trains to get on. There's no radio or internet or television. So the way that, you know, if you're French, the way that you're going to hear Beethoven is somebody in France publishes some of Beethoven's work, and then the musicians can play it or read it. Um, so that's exactly what happens. A publisher in Paris decided to bring out some of Beethoven's work, and Fetis 
you know, that kind of fancy pantsy guy decided that while he was kind of uh, copying it, he would edit it and, you know, make the harmonies work better. Because, you know, Beethoven's harmonies he felt were, were not as, as perfect as they should have been. So he just kind of fixed them up. Now, that was a totally normal thing to do. Nobody in Fadus' generation would have thought twice about that. Of course, when you copy the music, you add what you think is appropriate to it, and then you, you move on, right? Uh, you know, uh, Beethoven's not God. He's just a guy, and I'm going to make the guy's music work better, right? But young Mr. Berlioz was really upset by that. He thought that Beethoven was so special, so such a genius, that to violate his work was equivalent to defecating on a statue uh, and then strutting around saying that you've laid a, a golden egg. That's a line from, um, an, uh, he wrote a whole opera about how pissed off he was about this. And not only that, but he threatened to boycott um, the, uh, the publisher, and he went around uh, basically all over Paris. The conservatories to the opera made a big stink until the publisher had to undo the changes that Fetus had done. Now, that had never happened before. And Berlioz actually paid for it. He got blackballed. He never got a job in the academy. He ended up being hired like at the age of 50 as like the librarian or something like that. And only in retrospect, at the end of his life, was he kind of acknowledged as one of France's great composers of the era. So he basically paid his whole life for this act of insubordination. But he did it because he believed, because there was, there was this new moment in time that was happening that had a new discursive framework. The old discursive framework said, hey, it's perfectly okay to change something as you copy it. The new discursive framework, what I call the modern framework, said, mm -mm -mm, Beethoven's a genius and we should leave his work alone. Right? So there's this fault line between the two generations. Click. So basically, the new set of ideas that Berlioz was working from are the set of ideas that we've had for the last 200 years. And they're baked into our legal system, our educational system, they're baked into our media systems. They're baked into our brains. We all kind of take them for granted. But amazingly, none of them really existed before about 200 years ago. Um, and in the book, I kind of go through the history of these ideas in great depth, which I'm not going to do right now. But it really boils down to about six different ideas when you talk about music. One, that there's a difference between art and craft. One, that there's a difference, fundamental difference between an, audi an artist and an audience member. One, that there's a fundamental difference between an original and a copy. One, that there's a difference between performance as an act and composition as an act. Aesthetically, the notion that there's a difference between the figure, the foreground, and the background of a work. And then this kind of uh, industrial distinction between the materials and the tools that you use. And again, to go back to the theme that I introduced before, click. These ideas, this framework, is a map of basically the rules of an industrial capitalist society, right? Saying that art is more special than craft is like a form of what Marx called commodity fetishization. It's saying that certain commercial objects are special just in and of themselves, right? Like, you know, the difference between an iPhone and some rando Android phone, right? Let alone a Windows phone, right? This, this is like, this is the Beethoven of phones. This is special. This is art, right? And we hear it described all the time as art, right? Johnny Ives, iOS 7, it's blah, 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 right? The difference between an artist and an audience member, right? This was just the period of times where factories were becoming the way that things were built. And, you know, the difference between somebody who's a knowledge laborer, somebody who comes up with the designs, and somebody who's a knuckle-dragging lever puller who just stamps the same car hood out over and over again for 60 years and then dies of emphysema, that was necessary to that economic system and therefore necessary to that artistic system. The same with an original versus a copy, right? If we're all allowed to kind of take whatever we want and copy it and pass it around, then there's no value in an individual piece. But if I have the original Picasso, if I have the original Rembrandt, right, and you just have a poster of it, well, then, you know, mine is worth $20 million and yours is worth $20, right? So this is kind of the way that the entire economy was moving at the time. Um, likewise, performance versus composition map maps onto intellectual versus blue-collar labor. There's a reason that at just this point in time, the notion of being a composer became something exalted, whereas a mere performer didn't have the right to, to question, let alone alter, what the composer did. Um, the notion of the figure, something that stands in front of everything else, 
is really kind of a map for how the individual at this moment is exalted above the crowd. It's very hard for us in this era to understand, but people didn't fundamentally see themselves as individuals the way that we do now prior to this period in time. Um, of course, they, they understood themselves as people, right? But the notion that their subject, that your set of beliefs, that your understanding of the world is what's primary, right? And that you have individual rights and individual responsibilities, that stuff was a brand new idea. That's why, that's where the United States of America came from, right? We're each endowed with our maker, with, you know, with individual civil liberties. All those ideas were brand new ideas that were kind of baked into the musical um, assumptions of the era. And then finally, the difference between materials and tools. The notion that music is made, is manufactured, the same way that you'd manufacture a pair of shoes or a wooden ship, right, is, if you think about it, a fundamentally absurd notion. It's not like there's raw material sitting around everywhere and we take it and build it into something and then we sell it, right? But that is the way that we've organized, that's exactly the way that we've organized the music industry. We've managed to deceive ourselves into believing that that's the case. Why? Because it legitimizes the propertization of public goods, right? Like cutting down trees and turning them into ships, or you know, um, penning off cattle and turning them into shoes, right? Why shouldn't we do the same thing with ideas? Why shouldn't we take people's music and pen it off and turn it into a CD or an MP3? Um, so all these ideas kind of happen, and Berlioz is like, for me at least, is the avatar of this new set of ideas, the modern framework. Click. So then this thing happens with the internet, right? And all of a sudden, and it's very complex why and how, and I won't get into it unless you ask, but all of a sudden we have this new platform for creating and distributing and consuming culture that behaves fundamentally differently than industrial capitalism did, right? No more are there scarce CDs sitting on shelves at stores behind counters with registers all of a sudden, there's just a sea of ones and zeros around you. And you can just kind of catch those ones and zeros and pull them down into your personal devices and change them around and mix them up and send them back out, right? And every single one of us becomes a node in this network. There's no kind of boss nodes and surf nodes. There's no kind of uh, hierarchical structure to the flow of information. Uh, of course, that's not entirely true. Right, because of course there are super users and superstars and blah blah blah. Right, Justin Bieber has more followers on Twitter than you know the bottom billion users combined or whatever half a billion users. Um, but for the first time, you had this new. It's not like the old ways before Berlioz, but it's not like the modern ways either. You have this new kind of infrastructure that behaves fundamentally differently than media have in the past. But, so what happens when, uh, when we get this new infrastructure is that there's this explosion of configurable culture, these new cultural ideas that are just kind of so various and so beautiful to behold. And you guys all make this stuff, uh, I know, from your introduction, so you don't need me to describe it to you. But I'm in love with configurable culture. I love mashups. I love remixes. I love the, the ways that people are able to kind of you know have an idea combine a bunch of other ideas, mix it up, bring it into the world, and throw it out there. And then everybody else does their own thing with it. Click forward. So what this does, and I won't get really deep into this, but basically it used to be that, you know, under the kind of think about like broadcast television, think about the major labels uh, system. Right? You have a producer all the way on one end whose job it is to make stuff. And then you have a million consumers on the other end whose job it is to buy and use stuff. And that's it. Never the twain shall meet. Right? But all of a sudden, because of configurable culture, you get this kind of spectrum. Not only do you have production and consumption, but you get what I call production adjacent behaviors. Right? Like making a remix is not exactly the same as writing and recording a song from scratch, but it looks a lot like it. Right? And then you have stuff that's kind of consumption adjacent. Right? Making a playlist on your iPod is not, a, or on Pandora, is not exactly the same as just putting out a record and sitting back and listening to it, but it's close enough that you still feel like a consumer. But then there's all this stuff in the middle, right? Like mashups. Like, what is that? Is that more like listening to music, or is that more like making music? And the answer, of course, is that it's neither, right? And, and it's both. 
And the way that we draw that the line in that gray area tells us about what kind of a, a value system we want for our society overall, right? Because music is always the map of those social institutions. Click. So what that does to the modern framework is basically just like, you know, uh, oblivion, right? How can you tell the difference between what's art and what's craft? Who's an artist and who's an audience member? What's an original and what's a copy? Right? All of these distinctions that, remember, are not just artistic considerations, but are fundamentally, you know, um, isom isomorphic with our social structure go out the window. The entire belief system that's necessary to believe in our social structure is completely eradicated. And all of a sudden we have the freedom to kind of rewrite the rules, right? Without even realizing it. Most people don't think about this stuff tacitly. I mean, explicitly, but we feel it tacitly, right? We, we, we feel that there's something there. That's why we get so excited. That's why we get so upset when we find out that there's a new copyright law that's going to prevent us from doing something, or you know, a new government initiative to spy on us. And, and you know, just today it was it was outed that the NSA um, has been collecting information on what kind of pornography we look at, so that they can shame people who they deem radicals. Right? I mean, that repels us not only because it's an invasion of what we understand of, as privacy, but also because we understand that it's it's limiting our ability to participate in this new system that that alters the fundamental rules um, in, a, in a very profound way. Click. So what I did basically was uh, I did a big survey where I asked a lot of random like people like us, you know, what do you think of mashups and remixes? And then I did uh, hours and hours of interviews with DJs and record industry people and, and stuff like that. And here's what I found. Click. So on all six of those, um, of those binaries that I was talking about before, you get DJs acknowledging that there's a, a very gray area in between. And you see people basically trying to draw a line in the sand. Some people say, well, it's all art because it's all like Warhol and Duchamp, if you know those guys. And some people say, well, it's all bullshit. None of it is art, right? But then there's this kind of middle area where people have to say, like, well, is he putting the urinal on the wall, like Duchamp, or is he just taking the leap? I love that quote. That's from Steinsky, who's like one of the great hip hop producers of all time. And then people use terms like, you know, um, can it be taught? Um, are you transforming it creatively? Are you innovating? Um, all these kinds of notions that people bring to bear to try to figure out when does it become art and when does it become crap. But fundamentally, most of my interviewers acknowledge, you know, that's no longer a line that you can effectively draw. Quick. Can I ask a question? Please. Okay, so for instance, I keep thinking of SoundCloud, and you get yeah. these remixers who are remixing all of these songs, um, and it can even go for like an hour long, and you could have ten songs. How is that? Where does that fit in with the institution? How are they not being called out for stealing someone's song? Mm and making their own, like where does the licensing go? You're asking a few different questions kind of rolled up into one, if you want okay. you can kind of try to pull apart the strings. Yeah. First of all, um, there's, the, there's the technological basis, right? SoundCloud is SoundCloud because it lets you do that, right? A CD does not let you do that in a CD player, right? Vinyl does not let you do that. SoundCloud lets you do that, and the fact that people are doing it is a demonstration that there was a latent desire to do that that was not capitalized on in the eras of vinyl and CD. Our technology doesn't just enable us, it constrains us, right? So you create a technology that has fewer constraints, and all of a sudden people rush in to take advantage of that because that momentum was already there, right? It's like, it's like a dry dock or, you know, or like a dam. When the dam bursts, the water just flows right through, and that's essentially what happened, you know, technologically and, and culturally, with SoundCloud. Now, as to whether it's stealing, stealing is a is a word that has a meaning. If I steal something from you, it means that I've taken it away and you can't have it anymore. If I steal your shoes, I'm going to wear your shoes, and you're not going to wear your shoes, right? If I steal your birthday cake, you're SOL. You're not going to have any cake tonight. Right? But 
If I take a song that you made and I put that song into a different context, am I stealing that song? Are you no longer able to use that song? Are you no longer able to sell that song? Are there people who are no longer able to listen to that song? No, of course not. And this, this, this distinction between the way that um, so-called intellectual property works and the way that physical property works um, was acknowledged actually by our founding fathers when they were deciding whether or not to have copyright in America in the first place. There are these amazing letters you know, between uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison where they're kind of duking it out. And Jefferson, believe it or not, didn't want America to have copyright at all because he saw it as a check on free speech, which he thought of as the fundamental value of the American project. Right? And, and it was a form of government instituted monopoly. And he was very mistrustful of giving the government that kind of power to pick winners and losers in the marketplace. Um, so he eventually came around uh, and decided that copyright, the way that it was enshrined in the Constitution, which, by the way, is very vague and very limited, um, that it was a kind of a necessary evil in order to kind of um, to, to juice. Um, American cultural and scientific uh, progress, right, to kind of catch up and, with and surpass Europe. Um, we'll give people these, these patents and these copyrights so that they will have a financial incentive. Um, but what's happened is that those industries have been cartelized, you know, they've been concentrated in a handful of very, very large, very powerful stakeholders who have used their power and their money to juice the laws to tip the balance further and further in their favor over the years. Right? So ultimately, most inventors and most artists don't even control their own work or, or profit from it or, or derive the majority of the profit from it. Right? So record labels derive the majority of the profit from recordings, just like pharmaceutical companies or R&D companies derive the bulk of the profit from technological inventions. Right? So that fundamental job that those laws are supposed to do, which is inspiring people to create and share their cool new ideas, is not, it's not really working. Right? In fact, it's working, uh, the laws are working counter to those hopes and expectations. Um, and, and many smarter people than me have argued that you know, uh, if the founding fathers saw what intellectual property has become 250 years later, that you know they they would they would uh, turn over in their graves because it's the antithesis of, of what uh, America was supposed to be about. Um, so I, I'm guessing that uh, that uh, Josephine wants mm -hmm. me to talk a little bit about fair use. Well, I so, just put that up there because um, I felt like it was overlapping with some of the things that we had also talked about previously in the social media mashup mm -hmm. class. Um, Olivia, um, it was. It was, I guess, um, a few weeks ago. There were a few questions around fair use, and I had asked the question: um, if somebody, if I used, you know, six measures, you know, or six bar, six seconds, let's just say, six seconds of a song, is it, is it legal? Basically, and there were a lot of different answers, and I feel like what your question about SoundCloud and the sampling that goes on within there kind of overlaps with that. Um, so I'll say a bit about fair use and, and Aram if you want to add to that. But basically, um, fair use is the is the idea that any copying of copyrighted material um, is legal. That's done for a limited and transformative purpose, meaning that it has to be transformed in some way. And and that again is like what Aram speaks to as as far as a gray area goes. Um, basically, to transform it is to do commentary or criticize or um, add value to it in a creative way in a different sort but basically has to be creatively transformed and you can also reference um, who am I thinking of um, with the Jeff Koons is uh, is one that's always in the in the news as far as fair use goes there's actually um, a very interesting case and, right now yeah. the Beast oh, of yeah? Goldie's Goldie Blocks case have you been following this? no oh yes yes and um so, oh, and I forgot to say parody, too. So if it's um, commentary, criticism, if it's parody, so if um, Saturday Night Live you know, does a skit and there's like a song in there that's parody. So basically if it's commentary, criticism, parody, if it's being transformed in some way, then, you know, it's fair use. It's fair use of that copyrighted material. So it's not really... It's not really constrained by the amount of you know, time used in, you know, the amount of time sampled in a song or the amount of... Um, 
you know, material used in a visual art piece or anything like that. It's it's governed really by this very, very great, sometimes subjective judgment of what is and is not fair use. So, and I have a little post that I did in it. I'll repost it that kind of compares a Jeff Koons piece um, with another Jeff Koons piece in which one was he copied a um, postcard and um, made it into a small sculpture and another one is where he took um, an ad of shoes, um, women's shoes, and then he transformed it into sort of like a collage of um, women's legs and shoes. And in one, in one instance where he took the postcard, they said it wasn't fair use, it wasn't transformed enough. And then in the other instance, they said it was transformed enough because he had turned it into a collage, you know? So it's very subjective sometimes. And I think this is actually a really, really interesting sort of overview of like what is fair use? What is, um, you know, what are the issues of ownership? What is, you know, um, what's happening with the actual sort of creative and collaboration process in general? Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of, as Josephine points out, a lot of the power uh, to make these decisions under copyright law falls to the judges. And, of course, it takes, you know, 50 or 60 years generally to become a judge, which means that, you know, the people who grew up with configurability are not judges yet, right? So all these judges are like the Franz Joseph Fetus in my little story about the early 19th century. They're, they're the ones who grew up under the old you know, set of assumptions, the old discursive framework. And the people who grew up, you know, understanding how the internet works and understanding, you know, sample-based musical forms like hip-hop and techno and mashup, um, you know, they're still in law school or, or you know, uh, junior associates at their firms. And in another 20 years, when they're judges, presumably, um, we're going to see fair use interpreted very differently from the bench. But that is only if the cartels seeing this coming don't effectively lobby to proactively change copyright law in such a way that minimizes um, the impact of fair use on, on the rights of, of everyday people like ourselves. I think it's great that you brought up this analogy of fetus to sort of the judges that are presiding right now. I think that's like super, super salient. Um, but what were you saying um, that you had referenced before something about um, Stoli or um, like a case that's going on right now? Oh yeah, so there's maybe some of you saw this. So there's this awesome um, project that actually started on Kickstarter last year. That's basically like it's an, a set of engineering. You know, there's there's this kind of perennial problem of not enough girls becoming women who are engineers, right? And there's this really ugly gender gap in the so-called STEM science, technology, engineering, and math um, pursuits. And so um, one, this company has this approach, which is to basically market engineering toys to little girls. And they're called Goldie Blocks, as in like Goldie Blocks and Three Bears. And um, so they released a commercial uh, online a week or two ago that has a kind of parody of the Beastie Boys from their, uh, I think it was the License to Ill record. They had this stupid little song. I always hated it. Uh, girls to do this, girls to do this. It's this like, you know, explicitly sexist song. And many people have interpreted it as being itself a satire of sexist values. I'm not sure whether that's the case or not. When I was in high school, and that song came out, it was certainly not interpreted that way by many of my peers. Um, but then again, they were a bunch of stupid 14-year-old boys. So anyway, but it's it's Goldie Blocks. Oh, Goldie Blocks. Okay. Right. So anyway, Goldie Blocks did not get the permission of the rights holders, of the BC Boys who wrote the song that they're parodying in their ad. Now, they didn't sample the recording. They just parodied the composition. Two different copyrights, two different, totally different sets of uh, legal restrictions about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Parody is much easier when you're making fun of the composition than when you're using the recording because of some very stupid judges. I won't get into it. Um, so... Uh, so what happened was uh, the Beastie Boys sent Goldie Blocks a letter saying, yo, what's up? Why are you using our song? And by the way, Adam Yawk, uh, MCA, one of the three Beastie Boys who died two years ago, put it in his will that um, his songs, none of his musical work could be used for advertisements. Right? So that was his dying wish. And there is a certain amount of power that his intellectual property rights, as enacted through his will, have over his musical legacy. But, of course, that power is limited by fair use. And parody, as Josephine pointed out, is a fair use. So even if he put that in his will, if it's, fair, if it's a parody, 
then his will does not have the power to prevent advertisers from using the song erotically in their advertisements. And of course, this is a company that everybody wants to love because it's doing this great social work of allowing girls to grow up to be engineers. Um, so it's right now, right this moment, what happened was Goldilocks turned around and they decided to preemptively bring legal action to prevent uh, the Beastie Boys from suing them. The Beastie Boys did not sue them, but they kind of rattled their sabers and said, what's up? Um, so now, uh, nobody exactly knows what's happening because most of the documents are, are private, um, but there's this kind of brewing legal question as to whether the Goldie Blocks use of the song is fair use or not. What is, um, oh, well, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, I think it's super interesting because it is a parody, like, it's a parody, obviously, and then, but then they anticipate it, so they're filing a lawsuit anticipating the lawsuit, so I right. feel like it's just, like, a fantastic <laughs> PR move. Well, unfortunately, that's one of the things that intellectual property laws do, is they make, you know, it's like an arms race, right? I mean, if, if there was no such thing as a gun, you wouldn't feel, you know, any pressure to carry a gun around as you're walking, like, dark alleys in the middle of Chicago in the middle of the night, right? But if you know that there's such a thing as a gun, you're going to feel safer having a gun, right? Likewise, you know, I live in, in Montclair, New Jersey, because I teach at Rutgers in New Jersey, and, like, every, you know, I drive a little Mazda, too, but everyone else is driving these giant-ass, you know, SUVs, and the reason is there's an arms race. You know, if your SUV crashes into my car, I better be driving an SUV so that my children don't die. So I'm going to get a bigger SUV, and they're going to get a bigger SUV, and it goes on and on and on until everyone's in, like, Hummers and X5s. Um, so the same thing is true of intellectual property, right? Most, arguably, most creators are not terribly concerned with exerting ownership over their work in the way that IP frames it until they recognize that if they don't, someone else will, and they're going to lose what power they have. So then they have to assert copyright. And, and there are many examples of communities that didn't have copyright or even authorship. I write about some of them and mashed up until somebody else came in and started exploiting their work. And then all of a sudden they said, whoa, wait a second, this is copyrighted, man. Right? But they didn't say that or even think about it until somebody else came in riding the IP horse. You see what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's probably the, the case here, you know. The reason that they had to preemptively bring suit um, was because that threat existed, right? I don't think Goldie Blacks would have, you know, brought the Beastie Boys to court if they weren't relatively uh, concerned that the Beastie Boys were eventually going to bring them to court. Yeah, good point. Olivia, did you want to say something? Yeah, uh, I, I was just going to ask, um, just because of my film class, we've been talking about. Um, how there are like two different licensings, I guess, where you can get the license to the lyrics and then you can get the license to the song. Yep. And I forget the name. I forget what you call that. Um, sync I, licensing. Sync licensing. For both styles or for lyrics? Is it one or the other? Well, usually the composition is called a sync license and then the recording is called a master use, master rights use license. But that's often called sync licensing as well. Basically, okay, so any time you, you, you ask someone for the permission to use their work in synchronicity with, a, with video uh, information, that synchronization of the audio to the video is called a sync license. But it's, right. a more, it's more formally known as that on the publishing side and less formally known as that on the master's phonographic recording side. Okay, so like this commercial, Goldie Blocks, could have technically gotten at least the song and then change the lyrics. I mean not change the lyrics but have someone sing over it. Well they never would have they never would have gotten permission because the Beastie Boys because Adam Yawk put in his will that his work can't be used for uh, for so advertisements. It's, so instead they went for the parody because then they could get away with having the song. Well that that would be a cynical <laughs> interpretation. Okay. Or maybe they just thought that a parody of that song was the best way to get their message out. Right, yeah. Uh, not everyone's trying to cheat and bamboozle each other. I mean, that's kind of what the cop what the copyright cartels want us to believe is that fair use is people trying to get away with something. But if you think about it, fair use came first, <laughs> right? Copyright is relatively new, whereas people have been taking each other's ideas and ripping on them forever. Right. Right. I mean, if if you know Shakespeare was still under copyright, we wouldn't have West Side Story, right, or anything else for that matter. 
But I'm just, I've, I've actually watched West Side Story last night, so that's fresh in my mind. But, I mean, it's just Romeo and Juliet, right? With some kind of stuff in it. What about that, um, you remember a long time ago there was a song about Reagan or Bush or something that went... This land is your land, but it was about voting for Bush. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, it was 2004. It was a, a company called Jib Jab put out a... a that was it, Jib video. Jab. Why wasn't that... Didn't they get sued? Why didn't they just say that was a parody? It was a parody. But, but uh, didn't they, they get sued? Didn't they shut them down? Yes. Uh, I believe that they did get sued. I'm not sure. I, they probably successfully defended it because it was very obviously a parody and political use is, is a form of fair use. But it's often... Here's the problem, another problem with intellectual property law. And now we're kind of veering more into my second book than my first. But oftentimes, you know, the perception, as we were just talking about, is that consumers like us, consumers like us, use fair use as a way to kind of bamboozle to steal stuff from the real owners who are the big, you know, movie studios and, and record labels. But in reality, the opposite is more often true, which is that big, powerful companies assert IP rights to exert a certain kind of control that the law does not actually give them. So over and over again, we've seen, for instance, in the more recent election, 2012, um, there was a, a, um, a commercial for uh, Mitt Romney that used a clip of um, Obama singing um, that Al Green song. Baby, since we've been together. You know that song? I, I never heard Loving it. Loving you forever. It's an Al Green song. Um, Whether times are good or bad. I, I wish I, I'm going to look up that commercial now. Cause now I have anyway, to yeah. So Obama sings a clip of the song. Not a clip of it. Obama sings is a passage. Is it really Obama? Is it really Obama singing? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was he was clearly pandering to the black vote, trying to kind of like prove his African Americanness. <laughs> but that's a totally separate issue. But anyway, so in order to kind of use it against Obama, Romney put it into an advertisement, put that advertisement on YouTube, and that video got taken down on copyright grounds, even though it is an exemplary case of fair use. Right? Uh -huh. No no legal scholar would ever argue that that was not fair use. Right? It's political commentary. So in, a, in, in a major national election. But you, because of the structure of copyright laws, specifically one called the DMCA that got written about 15 years ago, um, YouTube had to take the video down as soon as there was a complaint. And it had to stay down for up to two weeks. Right? At, by which time the election was pretty much over. Right? So they were able to censor, the, the Obama campaign was able to censor the Mitt Romney video by invoking IP rights even when they didn't have IP rights. The same thing happened in the other direction. There was, there was a video of Michelle Obama speaking at the DNCA that got taken down because of a bogus copyright claim, even though it was clearly fair use. Right? So this happens all the time. And every time we increase the power of copyright laws, what we're essentially doing is increasing the power of large organizations who have lots of lawyers to censor us and each other at will because there's no, in America, there's no uh, penalty for falsely asserting intellectual property to shut down someone else's speech. Now, it's not that no one's come up with that idea. But there's no political will to enact that law because guess who's spending billions of dollars to lobby Congress to write the laws? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. it is a messed up system. It, it is. does not exist to serve the people or to live up to the spirit of the, the Constitution. Sure. What do you think about Aaron Schwartz? Do you have any thoughts about that? I've got tons of thoughts about Aaron Schwartz. Um, <laughs> you don't have... You, we won't betray you to the powers that be. <laughs> I, I make I, I wear my opinions on my sleeve. Fortunately, I'm I'm so uh, tiny and irrelevant that uh, there have no, only been the FBI a handful of smear campaigns against me. Say again. They're watching you. They're watching. <laughs> they're watching all of us. We now know this. I'm sure they they know what kind of pornography I like too, and they're probably disappointed to find out it's very banal. Um, the uh, you know the Aaron Swartz case was. Obviously very sad, but it, there is compelling evidence 
that the prosecutors knew that he had a you know a psychological history that would make him prone to the kind of depression and despair that eventually caused him to take his own life. Yeah. And you know there's there's very legitimate argument that that the uh, the computer fraud law that was used to um, you know to 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 uh, to prosecute him is a, a massively outdated law that was written uh, by technophobes who didn't fundamentally misunderstood the way that computers and society interact. So you know I think he will probably be remembered as uh, you know as a kind of a, a mother. Yeah, that's exactly what I think. Too. But it depends who gets to write history, you know. I actually use a small epigraph from him at the beginning of my book. Right, when I first, because I, when I came here last semester was my first semester, and he had just killed himself. And in my cybernetics class, they were talking about, it, and I was like, he's definitely a martyr. That was the first thought we all had, you know. Well, what was his grand crime, right? It was it was making Trespass, scholarship trespassing. <laughs> yeah, he's well, I mean that's that's the, that's a legal term, but what he actually did was make thousands of um, of academic Just papers one. publicly available, many yeah. of which had been written by publicly funded academics like myself at state universities. Why, if the taxpayers of New Jersey are paying my salary? Why in God's name should anything that I write be locked up behind a firewall that only allows wealthy institutions to have access to it? That doesn't make any sense. No, it, it really doesn't. I mean, he wasn't just some rebel with no cause. He was smart. I think he was working for MIT. You know. He, oh, he was brilliant. He was. He yeah, was he, was, he was. He was. He was a special person. You know, someone you don't want to die. You know, even more maybe than somebody else because he was like sensitive and, you know, perceptive and he might have been able to write good copyright laws or, you know, influence the judges or whatever, you know. Well, you know, there's still tons of, if, if some of you on the line don't know who Aaron Swartz was, uh, you can look up on, on YouTube, there's tons of video of him giving, he was a very young guy, giving a very perceptive and inspiring talks about uh, the value of, of intellectual openness uh, and, and how necessary it is to a technology-based culture like ours. Does anyone have any, we're sort of um, butting up right against 9.30 right now, so just to have a few more minutes, does anybody else have any questions? Um, I have a, a final question because I have to head out. Um, I was kind of wondering, to get to like the larger scheme of things, um, you talk about how like our society, you know, like our old ways aren't really working with, the, with where we are right now. Um, so where do you kind of see the future of music and music licensing mm -hmm. Going. Uh, it's not a question I can answer briefly. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a big question, but I don't know. I, I, I think, and I've been saying this for a, a long, long time. But I think what we're in the midst of um, industrially is a fundamental shift away from music as um, as a product that's sold to consumers and, and towards recorded music, at least as a service that is licensed to businesses, and those businesses can offer them to consumers, can offer the music to consumers under a paid or free or ad-supported environment. But it's really, I think, you know, copyright, insofar as it has a kind of functional value in the music industry, is largely in a business-to-business -business context. It's largely, I think, the future is, as as your question suggested, more about licensing than it is about sales per se. Um, you know. You can look at uh, you know the fastest growing businesses in the music industry are are you know all the subscription services and you know companies like Pandora and Spotify, uh, even iTunes. You know their new iTunes Radio product product is actually taking money away from traditional iTunes download sales and uh, and putting it into this kind of different model. So you know I, I think in the short term that's that's kind of the direction that things are moving in. You know, over the longer term, I think that, you know, we are, and this is why I wrote my second book, uh, The Piracy Crusade, I, I think that we are, the future's not yet written, and there's a lot at stake. And I, I don't think, I think that we've been able to, during the kind of analog or, 
you know, industrial days, if you will, we had this kind of middle ground where, you know, the record labels might know that you were kind of making your own mixtapes at home and maybe making one for your boyfriends, you know, uh, to tell them how much you love them, but they couldn't do anything about it, and that was kind of baked into their assumptions and their business model, and it was fine. And as long as you weren't, like, making a million copies and selling them on street corners, they weren't going to do anything about it. Now, that's kind of an oversimplification, but that's generally the case. The problem is that in this era where we have trillions of files zapping around the Internet on any given day, and where we have, you know, the five eyes, you know, the U.S., U.K., Australia, New Zealand, and Canada watching every single bit zip around every single network all the time, um, and doing so often at the behest of the content industries, there's no more middle ground. Either everything that we say and do is going to be surveilled, and our speech is going to be proactively censored to a greater and greater degree until we basically don't have a functional democracy, or we're going to have to fundamentally restructure all of our laws and economies and institutions in order to not only um, encompass the realities of today's configurable culture, but to be flexible enough and extensible enough to, to be able to change again as technology and culture continue to co-evolve at an accelerated rate in the future. Um, I would like very much for the second outcome to happen, but I'm very concerned, you know, if you look at, for instance, the leaked pages from the uh, TPP, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Treaty, that's being worked out between the U.S. And, and a couple dozen other countries right now, that we're moving in the opposite direction. We're moving towards a kind of information lockdown that, as benign as its proponents claim it is, and as many checks and balances as the laws put in name, we've already seen over and over again that that kind of power can't be checked and will inevitably be exploited for political purposes. Um, so, you know, I think, as always, as has been the case for the last couple thousand years at least, music will be one of the most important proving grounds for the battle between these two visions, and that music will be, you know, one of the most valuable chess pieces being moved around on the board because it has that kind of fundamental power to tell us something about who we are and how we relate to one another that precedes ideology, logical thought, even language itself. I hope that's not too vague an answer. Thank you. That was great. Okay. I actually was going to ask uh, that same question, so I'm glad you asked it, but I know we're um, getting ready to end. I just wanted to um, get your opinion. Um, have you seen that 24-hour music video, Happy? Uh, no. I haven't. You said, I'm sorry. Right. I have not seen that video. Oh, you have not? Oh, okay. No. I well, should. Won't. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. You want to just look tell so uh, a little I, bit about it, Kim? I think the domain is, um, I think that's the domain, 24, let me see if I can look it up real quick, uh, 24hoursofhappy.com. So um, <laughs> it's, okay. uh, it's, it's being um, advertised as the world's first 24-hour music video, and uh, the song oh, is happy. I think Christian Markley beat. Okay. Yeah, it's 24hoursofhappy.com. Okay. Okay, it's definitely not the first 24-hour music video, but I, but that's it still sounds like a cool project. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. So, yeah, this, my first encounter with it, I was just wondering what implications something like this. I know in your book, um, the chapter that I read, which I, I enjoyed, uh, you talked about audience and artists. Yep. and how that, um, I guess the lines are blurring there. So I just really thought this was like a, a like well, you're groundbreaking, breaking. even though it's not now. Well, no, <laughs> but I just thought up. that I, this I, concept was really creative, and what are the options of this for the future? Hours. Am I breaking? You're breaking Can you hear me? a little bit, but I, I think I basically heard your question. I, I'm Can sorry you if I sound up a little bit better. Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, um, I, sorry. I don't mean to be dismissive. I think it's it's very cool. And you know, what what I would say is that um, to time. I actually have. I wish I had more time to talk about this. Haha, <laughs> ironically. But what what I'll say is this: is that one of the most powerful ways in which our lives are regulated by media is through is through time, right? If you think about it, you know, what's the first thing you see when you turn on your device? You see what time it is, right? Um, and and that's been going on for 150 years, ever since time was standardized around the globe with you know Greenwich Mean Time, Eastern Standard Time, and so on and so forth which was done specifically in order to create a technological infrastructure, the railroad system, that is kind of the technological antecedent to the Internet in terms of its, both it, uh, the, its kind of structural logic and the role that it plays in transforming society. So music, obviously, is, you know, time is its medium. And there's this great quote uh, by this French uh, author named Jacques Attali, who wrote this awesome book called Noise, A Political Economy of Music, where he says that music is what he calls uh, a dialectical confrontation with time. And that basically means, that's just fancy language to mean that when we are engaged in music as producers or consumers or something in between, we are actually playing with the experience of time in a social way, right? I mean, like, a great example is if you guys ever listen to, like, DJ Screw, you know, like, Chopped and Screwed remixes, nod your head if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's like you're on Purple Drank and you're listening to, you know... Uh, normal stuff, right? And, you know, by creating a space in which your sense of everyone who's listening to it has an altered perception of time, you are fighting back against the imposed regulation of time by, you know, this kind of international consortium, by our phones, by every device around us. There's clocks freaking everywhere all the time, right? So, you know, I think that one of the ways that that's manifested itself in the commercial music industry is that we have this tradition of three-minute songs, right? Which, if you look historically across cultures, is completely not arbitrary, but is, is completely distinct, right? Classical music, Indian music, African music, right? Most musical, prior to, prior to the recording era, most music took place over a much longer duration than three minutes. And there are several reasons why we arrived at three, min three minutes. Some of it has to do with that was the amount of groove that you could cut into a 78 RPM shellac record. Part of it was that radio stations um, need to cycle the content out as fast as possible so that people will keep listening and so that advertisers can get their ads in on a regular basis, right? They've got 20, 30 minutes, 20 plus minutes of advertising per listener hour on commercial radio. Uh, you can't do that if you have a 50-minute song, right? So, um, so there are all kinds of reasons that songs have been restricted to three minutes. And one of the beautiful things about the Internet as a distribution platform for, for music is that it lifts a lot of those constraints, both economically and technologically, right? You don't have the 78 RPM record anymore, and you don't have the commercially um, sustained, you know, radio station anymore. You have, I mean, those still exist, but they're kind of peripheral to what actually happens on, say, the SoundCloud. So I think in many ways, I love your question, you know, the 24-hour music video is a bold exploration into reclaiming subjective temporality for musical culture and, and a way to kind of, like, raise the middle finger to those forces that have kept us locked up inside these, you know, three-minute boxes for the last hundred years. Does that answer your question, Kim? Thank you. Thanks. I think she's having some yeah. sound issues. Um, well, hopefully okay. she can see the... Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay, great, great. Great. Um, thanks. So, um, yes. Yes, thanks, Kim. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, I actually love the way that this discussion went, Aram. Me too. That's why I, I, yeah. I always prefer a conversation to a presentation. Yeah, I mean, no, I like that the, the the presentation was there because I really, I mean, I love that presentation anyway to begin yeah. with, and I think you Thank know you. Um, the visual aid aids are really um, great, some sort of jumping board um, for the discussion. So, um, yeah, no, I, I love the way that it kind of crossed over and talked about like mashup, but then you know got into like the granular areas of like the modern versus you know the historical modern versus more emergent frameworks. It's Great. Well, thank you. I, it's 
I, I appreciate your appreciation, and, and I always enjoy <laughs> talking with you and your students, and, and love the opportunity to, to have these kinds of conversations. So thank you for inviting me. Great. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks, All for, right, and so, thanks for the discussion.